The first thing is I would tell young voters is that if you always do what you've always done, you'll always be where you've always been. With a new speaker in place, all eyes are on Congress to see if they can bring fiscal order to America and peace to the world. Today, we speak with Congressman Byron Donalds, a new breed of leader who's unafraid to ask the questions that others won't, and who believes you can't secure the future by looking in the rearview mirror. From Ballard Studios in Washington, D.C., it's 13th and Park. We give you information, not a panic attack. I mean, look what's going on. I mean, my God, this was it. My kids were gonna die. That time is gone forever. This is the biggest story in America. We weren't prepared for this. Don't you want to speak truth to power? Toughest thing I ever had to do. Congressman, great to have you on the show. A few things have been going on in Washington the last couple of weeks. Pretty laid back and relaxing, right? This has been the easiest stretch of my time in Congress. (laughs) Not even close. It must have been obviously flattering when your name was brought into nomination, not once, but several times during the course of, we'll say, the McCarthy era to now the Mike Johnson era. How did that feel? Well, the first time when I got a vote, it caught me off guard. I was like, wait, what? (laughs) Did somebody just say me? Uh, So that was the first time. And then, you know, with the group of members that were in opposition to Kevin at the time, Mm -hmm. we had a meeting and, you know, my name came up about who to nominate. And I was like, wait, what? And so I, I, I was like, I need a minute, you know, because at that point, you never really know what could happen. And to be in a position to be the second most powerful person in D.C., that's a responsibility, all-encompassing responsibility I never ran for Congress to want to do. And so I remember I'm standing in the back, and I believe it was either Chip Roy or Dan Bishop. I can't remember which one was first. I think it might have been Chip Roy. Give the nominating speech, and I'm standing in the back of the chamber listening to this nominating speech. I'm just thinking like, oh, my gosh, this is really happening. My mom is probably freaking out, being like, (laughs) what is going on? How did my son get into this? But to just know that there are members who just, you know, believe in you to that degree uh, is amazing. So how much of this goes back to your growing up in Brooklyn, single mom, all those life experiences where I think, you know, I read you, you never felt anything should ever be given you. This is something that, you know, you have to kind of go out and earn. How did that maybe in a kind of funny way, Byron, lead you down the path you're now on? Well, I mean, look, growing up, nothing was given to us. You know, my mom didn't have much of anything. She did the best that she could. She put me through school because she didn't think the public schools were going to be able to help me. She was right. And so she made a ton of sacrifices for me. And so growing up, you just know anything you're going to get, you're going to have to work for. You're going to have to scratch. You're going to have to claw. You're going to have to fight. And so that that kind of mindset has always stayed with me, you know, regardless of being a member of Congress or even even back when I was in the business industry and the finance world, cutting my teeth there. You just know you just have to work hard. A funny thing now is, you know, we're in the middle of races or even the speaker's race. People were calling me, man, are you excited? And I'm like, yeah. And they're, yeah. Like, and they're like, they're like, they're like, you don't sound excited. And I, I was telling them, I'm like, for me, the work is the work. You celebrate when it's done. But until then, keep, you know, keep your head down. Don't get too high. Don't get too low. You just keep working. You just keep grinding. And I think my upbringing is a really big part of why I always look at it that way. But you've also, you continue to be, I think, a mentor to youth and youth sports through the church. How does that kind of ground you, Byron, here? You know, there's a lot of group think that happens in D.C. How does that kind of keep your feet on the ground a little bit so you have that perspective you might not have if you were 365 inside the Beltway? Uh, because you realize that most of the things we talk about up here on Capitol Hill, most people aren't even thinking about. You know, even while we were going through this decision-making to get to Speaker Johnson. Most people at home are like, are you guys just going to figure this out? (laughs) So internally in the chamber, all the machinations and all the issues, it just made them seem less important when you get that feedback from back home. Government funding, policies, all that stuff is important. I'm not trying to diminish it. But to have a perspective from outside of this town, that's what keeps you grounded. Helps you understand that It's never as bad as the morning blogs we all get in our email tell us it is. It's never that bad. It's never that good. Most people just are looking at the results. So just do what needs to be done to make sure we get the right results. But you once said that you prefer a majority 
with drama as opposed to one <laughs> yeah. everyone's in lockstep yeah. behind one another. Yeah. Isn't that the kind of message that maybe elevated you somewhat within the Repu- even the Republican conference as someone that is determined to get things done in a different way than maybe has been done in the recent past? Yeah, because look, I never have remembered a, a team that won the championship that didn't have some sort of drama or some sort of issues or some sort of adversity they had to overcome. It was never a situation where they, the only championship team I remember like that was the 96 Bulls. They came in the number one team, they left the number one team, but even that team had Dennis Rodman on it. Right. Dennis Rodman was on that team. Scottie Pippen was looking for more money. Phil Jackson was looking for more money. (laughs) Michael Jordan was, I mean, there was still issues that they had to overcome. You know, I'm a huge Laker fan, the Shaq Kobe Lakers. They had a lot of personal inner dynamic issues they had to overcome. But when you were able to work through those issues, that drama, if you will, a beautiful thing happened. There was a steely resolve from that group. And so, you know, in this Congress, it's been a lot of drama. But I still believe that, you know, now with Speaker Johnson at the helm, there is a resolve of our members to be able to stand toe to toe with the Senate, stand toe to toe with the press stand toe-to-toe with the president because we, at different times we've done, to, we've done it toe-to-toe with each other. Right. Um, and I think you earn a respect for each other. There's a more depth of understanding of where everybody's coming from. I think you start to realize the, the where the real lines of agreement are mm-hmm. past just being Republicans. And I think it gives you an ability to accomplish something special. Was it flattering that essentially the entire Florida delegation in the last balloting for speaker kind of rally behind you. I mean, that you got tremendous players, Mario diaz Ballard, Vern Buchanan, all sorts of people that have spent a lot of time here that really have made Congress work in good ways. And suddenly they were, were for Byron. Yeah. Mario and Vern, I, you know, I told them, I was like, man, I'll never forget it. Hmm. I never will because for veteran members of, of this process to look at, you know, somebody who's basically, who's in the middle of his third year up here, I think, you know, they saw something in me that would that could really get the job done. And so, you know, even though it's not me, totally fine. I'm going to still use whatever tools and talents and leadership they believe I have to help us be successful. And I, and I think that, you know, going through that process, a lot of the members who know who knew me, but they didn't know me as well. They got an opportunity to kind of take my measure. I think they've, I've earned their respect. And so... You know, what's the next mission? Let's go do that. There are plenty of missions ahead, as you know. So you had kind of an aha moment back, I think it was in 2008, when you were working in the credit part of the financial industry and you saw a House Financial Services mm-hmm. Committee meeting yeah. and you said, basically, they don't know what the heck they're talking about. Now, fast forward, you're on House <laughs> yeah. Financial Services. Yeah. Do they know what's going on? What do they need to focus on now to get the country's financial house in order? Well, the first thing is I hope that there's not some young kid out there saying, I don't know what I'm talking about. (laughs) (laughs) Because you talk about high irony. I think we are focused there. There's a lot of disagreements with the Democrats, um, especially around financial regulatory uh, issues. Um, I just left a group and we were talking about access to capital and how to get, you know, marginalized communities to have more of a share, more of a a chance in the financial world. And and I was very clear that then you have to start really addressing financial regulation. Like Dodd-Frank's one of the worst pieces of legislation ever created. Why is that? Because it made the big banks bigger Hmm. through capital requirements, through new rules. Community banks were eviscerated under Dodd-Frank. We created an unconstitutional agency now known as the CFPB that has no oversight from Congress like zero, but they have the ability to walk into any company, public or private, mind you, and then just basically assert consumer protection as their guide, and they can bring fines and they could cause all kinds of havocs. There's no oversight. They're an entity unto themselves, uh, not the way our country was designed to operate. And so when you have these various regulatory burdens on the financial industry, it makes capital more expensive, it makes capital more scarce, and if you're a poor person trying to come up in the world and find a loan, to begin to, your enterprise to try to make a business, try to do something, who's the bank going to lend to? They're going to lend to you, a startup, or they're going to lend to somebody who's got collateral right. and has been around a while. And so I think it, it actually limits the ability for people to come into, into the financial world and to do business and to grow or to start something to then grow. It makes it very difficult. 
So I go to bed at night when I'm thinking pessimistically about things. And I have an image. And the image is the national debt clock. Yes. And it just keeps ticking in one direction. I want to play you a clip that was recently on uh, Bloomberg. Get your reaction to this since you're one of those fiscal hawks trying to get things kind of back together again. All right. What's the math as opposed to the policy differences before we get to the policies? Well, the math is the debt to GDP ratio is on an unsustainable path, meaning we just can't go there. And we can fight about how to address it. That's a reason for legitimate political discourse. But denying that it's a problem is not. And we can't say that we won't raise any tax or cut any spending. There's no door number three. There's no door number three. Now, you, you're a little too young to remember Monty Hall, <laughs> right? And let's make a deal. A One of my bit, favorite shows. Yeah. But what it is is, yeah, we, we have to make a tough choice. Where do we start so that the debt clock doesn't continue to tick against what, frankly, are future generations that have to deal with that burden? Well, the first thing is, and this is kind of glib, but it's also serious. Thomas Massey out of Kentucky has now made like a little lapel pin of the debt clock. And it actually continues to spin based upon how the oh, it actually works. Oh, it actually works. It's tracking every day. So I told Massey, I was like, I need one. And every member of Congress should have one. So I think he's working on that. I think that's the first thing for the members to, for it to be constantly in their face. I think from a revenue standpoint, you have to have the economic policies that are going to drive growth and drive the ability for the government to collect more taxes. Mm -hmm. Higher tax rates has now been studied and it's now proven. Higher tax rates don't yield more revenue. The right tax rate yields more revenue. Under Tax Cut and Jobs Act, we're now raising 20% of GDP and tax revenue in the federal government, the highest percentage of our economy in history. Yeah, Never happened before. Yeah. So if that's the tax dynamic that works, then just keep that going and then figure out the policy changes so you can grow your economy even more. That starts with energy production. Energy production domestically is going to be critical to that. Yep. Because if you have domestic sources of energy, if we're exporting to the rest of the world, that's only going to drive our GDP higher. And if you're collecting 20% of revenue of a rising GDP, there's more tax revenue coming in. And now that addresses your revenue side. But here's the big deal. Mandatory spending. Washington, the last 20 years, has had a terrible habit, the politicians, of punting policy spending parameters into mandatory so they can never be touched. They can never be right-sized. They can never be evaluated if they're actually working. That's more than Social Security. It's more than Medicare. It's both sides, right? Been guilty of... Both sides have done it. Right. And it's wrong. So you have to stop that trajectory and actually bring more things back to the discretionary side of the budgets, where members of Congress have to make those decisions because we were elected to represent the people. We weren't elected just to kick it off into the mandatory side and say, oh, there's nothing we can do. We only really have control over 15 percent of the budget. That, that's ridiculous. So we have to undo that. The third thing, which, again, is going to be tough. Not a lot of people want to hear it. Social Security goes insolvent in eight to nine years now. Medicare goes insolvent in about nine to ten years. We're going to have to address the programs. Now, there's solutions out there where you actually don't touch benefits for current retirees and even new retirees that are about to come on. Mm -hmm. But you are going to have to address some top line benefits and out year benefits for people who are in my age bracket. Like I'm 45. I know that the programs are going to be in trouble. So then it's. As long as I'm told that and told what the new expectations are, I have time to adjust my life and manage it accordingly for my retirement. But if you even bring that issue up, yeah. you know you're into the hyperbole where he says, oh, my gosh, he's, he's talking about Social Security. He wants to end Social Security. And no, it's I never don't. that. You want to save it. But even addressing it, you opened yourself up to all sorts of people on both ends that just want to see the whole thing in black and white. And it's not right talking about yourself, someone who's in their 40s, you know, looking ahead to be promised something that you now know, probably more than ever, may not really be there. No, I do know that. And the thing that's going to be the most damning overall, we're 33 and a half trillion in debt. By the end of the presidential election, it's going to be about 35 and a half trillion. We are more than 100 percent of debt to our GDP. The United States could probably handle 200 percent, 250 percent of debt to GDP. After that, this whole thing's over. We have to be that direct with the American people. Right. There is not going to be an ability to borrow the money mm. to make the Social Security payments or the Medicare reimbursement payments 
or to pay for the SEC or the CFTC or Treasury, heck, or defense. In a couple of years, interest is going to be the number one line item in the federal government. More than defense, interest. This is where we're going to. So you have to be realistic and do the prudent things now to protect the country going forward. Because we're the best country in the world. As long as we're not acting like the Roman Senate in the latter years of the Roman Empire, just ignoring the fiscal realities of the empire and just putting it all into the hands of Caesar and then walking away. And we got to stop that. So let me ask you a political question. As a Republican, there are now four black Republican members of Congress. Why is it that the Republican Party has such a difficult time appealing to African Americans as they seem to be doing a good job among Hispanic Americans over the last couple of election cycles? What is holding us back? Is it our message? Is it our approach? What is it? I think for the longest time, the party has just not been comfortable talking with black voters. And I think that's partly because political consultants have just said for a long time, there's no votes to be had in the black mm -hmm. community. Mm -hmm. You can get them out of the white community. You can get them out of aspects of the Hispanic community. And that's where you go to get your votes. I think the Democrats have done um, a very good job of, of gaslighting black voters around race and around voting rights. A Republican state, Florida, black voters vote in record numbers with no issues. Nobody's stopping black people from voting. Not in Florida, frankly, not in anywhere in the country. It's just not happening. If you want to talk about race relations, it's always just been harder for Republicans to deal with it and talk about it. And there's not been a comfort. And I think it's not because Republicans don't value black people. That's not true at all. I think it's a matter of there's not been, for some of our elected members, that exposure to people in the black community of how do you go about discussing issues? How do you engage and understand black culture in America? Right. Those things are important. And I think that as politics has begun to shift and modulate and change in our party and in the country overall, a couple of things have occurred. One, you have the most amount of black Republicans in, on Capitol Hill since Reconstruction. That's been a process over decades. You also have a lot of black voters who are starting to become more independent in their voter registration, and even some who are now openly becoming more Republican in their voter registration because the black community just being monolithic for the Democrat Party hasn't worked out for the black community out. either. So I think this is going to shift and adjust itself over time. I fully anticipate you're going to see more black people, mm -hmm. namely black men, vote Republican in the next election cycle. Why is that? The future of their kids does matter. Mm -hmm. They don't want gender ideology being taught to their children. They are looking at this economy. They are looking at the southern border and basically saying, this is nuts, this is crazy. Right. The other thing that you're starting to really see is the reformation of, of the black family and the black middle class. That's growing in our country again. After years of, of destruction through the 60s and 70s and the 80s, that's growing again. And so when mothers and fathers are working hard and they're at home and they're raising kids and their eyes are now on the future and not on contemporary issues that might be happening, that are distasteful when they happen, then they start thinking about economic policy and foreign policy and, and some of those things. And I think that's why you're starting to see them now focus more on their voting habits of like, you know, I, you know, I think I'm a Republican, even though I'm not registered as one. And they're starting to vote that way. Well, because of vote by mail in particular, yeah. young voters are now more important than ever. I, I can tell you as a, as a media consultant on many years of campaigns, we said, oh, you know, people under 25, they're probably not going to vote. There's not much we can do there. Now they are critical. What is the message that you would give young voters for them to feel that proverbial shot in the arm that tomorrow is going to be better than what they see today? The first thing is I would tell young voters is that, you know, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always be where you've always been. Like you've been voting for Democrats thinking things would change. They haven't changed. They've gotten worse. So why would you keep doing the same thing? Number two, young people, because I, I have three sons. My oldest is 20. He's in college now. I have a 16-year-old. I got a 12-year-old. They've grown up in a world that is highly customizable to their environment. Mm -hmm. You saw the report where there are more kids are not getting driver's licenses right. than at any other segment in American history. Because why? They Uber. Because they can call a car anytime they want to just using their cell phone. They DoorDash. So they can get semi-hot food. It's not hot. They can get semi-hot food right to their door whenever they want to. 
I'll tell you one quick story. One of the biggest dreams I had growing up was like, man, when I have my own house, I'm going to get a big screen TV. Because <laughs> when I get a big screen, man, I've right. hit it. I'm here. So, I mean, in my in my house, man, I had three of these things. I had one in this room, one in that room. It's great. I'm watching TV. What are my sons doing? They're pulling out their phone. They're watching TV like this. And, and you're I'm, like, you're like, and I'm like what are you doing? Like, look at the TV right there. They're like, yeah, I don't want to do that. I just want to watch what I want to watch right here. But that's their world. They are fully customizable. So I think for young voters, they got to understand that the politics that they want to have to continue that customizable lifestyle is the politics of a limited federal government, not an overbearing one. An overbearing federal government doesn't give you choices. It takes them away. A massive federal government doesn't give you the ability to be more customizable. It limits your choices. So in your own life, you want a customizable life. Don't choose a government that makes it less possible. Choose people who want to give you more freedom and more choices. They want to put those decision makings in your hand. They don't want to take those decisions from you just because we gave you some slogan that sounded cool. Right. One election every four years or every midterm election going out those years. So that, that's my message to young people. So obviously the world is dealing with the turbulence in the Middle East. Yeah. And yet on college campuses, there's been a lot of protest that has been read as anti-Israel, anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic. And college administrations are, are trying to figure out what to do. And a lot of them are trying to play the middle ground when the whole thing began with a terrorist assault mm -hmm. on innocent people on one day. How was that issue an issue that should concern all of us in terms of where young Americans are right. and making sure they get the full story, the whole story, before they react to one piece of it, which seems to be in play far too often in too many places. Well, first, the protests on these campuses, they are anti-Semitic and they are anti-Israel. You have a situation where Hamas launched one of the worst terror attacks on any country in the history of the world. Those are the facts. Hamas did that. So now to argue for ceasefires or now to argue for the plight of the Palestinian people when the political group that they elected and keep in power fomented and executed a heinous terrorist attack? No, that's ridiculous. I think for the college presidents, they got to stop playing the middle ground. Yeah. And they have to start being realistic and factual about where things are. A great detriment we've done to a lot of young people in this country is that we have given them the false view that their emotions dictate reality. How they feel about an issue demonstrates how the issues should actually be handled or how they should be addressed. That's not true. A lot of times your emotions mislead you. Nobody wants to see the Palestinian people be killed. Right. Nobody wants that. But we have to acknowledge that Hamas is using them as human shields. Those are war crimes. If you want to launch a military attack against another country, then you have to stand in military garb away from civilians. And then you have that fight. You don't embed yourselves amongst children and amongst women. You don't go into towns and into kibbutz in southern Israel and behead babies and rape women while you're doing it. And so I'm very concerned about what's happening on, on these college campuses because I think that a lot of these young people are not being told the full information by a lot of these professors. And a lot of these college presidents who may or may not agree on, from an ideological perspective are allowing this misinformation to persist on the campuses that they have. So I think even at Harvard now, you have some of their big donors. The large alumni are now saying, I'm not giving you a dime. Right. I'm not doing this anymore. That is a good thing. And that should continue to happen. And I think more Americans should speak out about this. How is this different than Ukraine? In terms of what America needs to do, this is being conflated here in Washington. Right. Well, if we're supporting Israel, also that's to support Ukraine mm -hmm. and their fight against the incursion from Russia. Mm -hmm. How are these different? Well, Ukraine is very different. Number one, Israel is our greatest ally, not Ukraine. Now, we have an agreement, the Budapest Agreement from 94, to protect Ukrainian sovereignty. But Joe Biden and, to a lesser degree, Barack Obama, they did not live up to that agreement. Right. Barack Obama watched Putin invade Crimea. He didn't do anything. The Ukrainians have been begging us for military equipment. They were willing to buy it from us. Barack Obama and Joe Biden weren't giving it to him, weren't selling it to him, even though they were willing to buy it from us, knowing full well that Vladimir Putin has been wanting to invade Ukraine for a long time. 
the difference really stems from the fact that we have been part and parcel with Israel since the very creation of Israel. Yeah. And that long-standing relationship is not something you just step away from and walk away from. As a matter of fact, if you do, it would be a signal to every other ally, basically saying, oh, well, wait a minute, if the United States is going to walk away from Israel, would they walk away from me? That's just the reality. Right. Ukraine, very different situation. I think that you know the support levels we've had for Ukraine to this point have been good from a dollar's perspective. They've been bad from a strategic perspective. What's the end goal? How are we going to effectuate it? What are we actually giving the Ukrainians? Are we trying to negotiate peace or negotiate a ceasefire, if you will? Or is this just a political stance from the president and from the Democrats now because his dereliction basically allowed left Ukraine open to be invaded? Those are all the questions that are there. And the biggest thing now, now that we're $114 billion in and Joe Biden wants another $60 billion, is how are you going to pay for it? That's where that little pin that with the national debt squad comes into the play, right? Comes That's in. a reminder. Right? How are you going to pay for right. it? Like, and it, So their answer is, oh, no, no, these are emergencies. We shouldn't have to pay for that. Mm-hmm. No, like we're not going to do that anymore. Yeah, this is a time for confession. So you were on with Stephen A. Smith, who I love, yeah. and you confessed where your loyalties are. Let's oh, play this clip. I want to hear this. First of all, before we even get into all of that, who are you, since you're a sports fan, who's your favorite team? I need to know the answer to this question. Who do you root for? Man, listen, I root for the Lakers. Okay. And I root for America's team, the Cowboys. Oh, and I know Lord. you got issues, but that's oh, my, my team. Oh, my Lord. Oh, my Lord. You done that's messed my team. up. You done messed up now. I mean, I, 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 you done messed up. There's no hope for you now. There's no hope for you. No offense. You're you're from Florida. So you've got the yeah. Miami Dolphins, the Tampa yeah. Bay Bucks. You have Jacksonville, the Jacksonville Jaguars yeah. doing great. Yeah. The Heat have had great seasons. And yet yeah. your loyalties, yeah. your, your love is with America's team in Dallas yes. and the L.A. Lakers. Well, first of all, those teams in Florida, they're pretty good. <laughs> but um, when I was growing up, In the New York market, the team that is on TV more than any other team is the Dallas Cowboys. That's true, right? They're on TV probably as much as the Giants, and they're definitely on TV more than the Jets. That might have changed, but when I was growing up in the mid-90s, you had the triplets, you had Aitman, you had Emmett, you had Irvin, Mm -hmm. Charles Haley, you know, Russell Maryland and those boys. The team was phenomenal. And I'm sitting there as a kid, you know, 12, 13, 14 years old. The Cowboys are on all the time, and I'm watching and I remember it was the 94 NFC Championship game, and I didn't like the 49ers, so I'm rooting for the Cowboys. And they lost. And Dion, by the way, Florida State, Deion Sanders played a great game. Shout to Dion. I just started liking the star on the helmet, and I just started liking the Cowboys from when I was a teenager. And listen, I've been in purgatory with my Cowboys. We have not been back to the Super Bowl. It's now 23 years since I think we won the, we won the Super Bowl. I can't even count. It's been too many. It's been too long. Now to the Lakers. I'm a basketball fan. I'm a basketball junkie. My favorite player before Kobe Bryant was Charles Barkley. Mm. Loved Charles Barkley. He's awesome. When I was in college, you know, you're in college, you're broke. You're trying to find any way to get money. And I was betting NBA playoff games, betting the LA Lakers. This is now the Shaq Kobe Lakers. Oh, yeah. So I'm betting people who hated, they're like, we hate the Lakers. I'll bet you whatever you want. Okay. (laughs) So I'm betting like $25 a game and I'm betting the Lakers and I'm winning money. And so I just started rooting for him because I'm, I got money on the that line. That put you through college, right? <laughs> it, put, it put food in my belly, you know. So I'm I'm rooting for the Lakers because I got money on the line. And I just started love Shaq, love watching him play. Um, and then really just started rooting for the team. Became a huge Kobe Bryant fan. And I'm a Laker fan. Well, you know, going back to the football, the reason you saw more of the Dallas Cowboys than the Giants or the Jets, there's a hidden secret that in New York, they try to hide those teams, right? <laughs> <laughs> given what they've done of late. Anyway, best of luck to you. I can't wait to see you wearing the, the dead clock pin. Continue to charge forth, Congressman, because, you know, a, a lot of people are looking at Congress now with new leadership to show something maybe that hasn't happened there perceptionally for a while, which is to get things done. So go forth and conquer, as they say. That's what we're going to go do. Thanks. Great to have you on the show. Thank you. Remember to subscribe today and hit the bell so you never miss another episode of the show with that trademark opener from Washington, D.C., it's 13th and Park.